Welcome everyone to this webinar organized by the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership, GARD-P. My name is Claire Dool. COVID-19 has really been the first devastating pandemic in a generation, but there is already another pandemic with us. And as that video showed, it's the silent pandemic of antibiotic resistance that claims some 700,000 lives annually. For years, antibiotics used to treat bacterial infections have become less and less effective. If that current trend continues, they may stop working altogether, leaving us very vulnerable to deadly drug-resistant superbugs. So, COVID-19, what are the lessons learned and how can we apply them to tackling antibiotic resistance? With me to discuss this is Dr. Manika Balasaragam, Executive Director of Guard P, Dr. Mark Mandelson, Professor of Infectious Diseases and Head of Division at the Infectious Diseases and HIV Unit, at the hospital in Cape Town, which is the hospital where there was the first heart transplant ever. And we also have Dr. Joanne Liu, who is a associate clinical professor at the University of Montreal and former president of MSF International. We're going to be hearing from all of our speakers and then digging a little deeper into the issues before we go to you, the audience, so I would really like to encourage you to submit questions in the Q&A and tell us who you would like to answer that question. And of course, please also tweet using either the Twitter handle at GuardP underscore AMR or hashtag AMR, hashtag antibiotic resistance or hashtag antimicrobial resistance. But with further ado, no further ado, let me ask, first of all, Dr. Mark Mendelssohn, who is a clinician treating patients with COVID and also treating patients with uh, disease-resistant infections, uh, to give us his thoughts on learning from COVID-19 to tackle the silent pandemic of antibiotic resistance. Mark, the floor is yours. Claire, thanks very much indeed. Um, and thank you to the organizers for um, this opportunity to really share with you some reflections from a clinician's viewpoint um, on how COVID-19 has shone a light on the pandemic of antibiotic resistance. To look at some of the similarities, but also to look at the glaring um, issues that COVID-19 has highlighted some of the deficiencies that we find in our response to the AMR pandemic. Sorry, I'm just going back. So it's it's ironic, isn't it, that um, inappropriate antibiotic uh, use is again, once again, being driven by a virus. We're so used to antibiotics being given in the community for the common cold as being one of the uh, most important drivers of community uh, inappropriate antibiotic use. And here we are now again in a pandemic um, with a virus that is once again causing a problem in terms of antibiotic use. And it's this inappropriate use and imbalance between the number of uh, actual documented bacterial co-infections in patients with COVID-19. And this systematic review showed a pool prevalence of only 7% of cases of COVID-19 having bacterial co-infection. Yet in the ISARIC database in inpatients in hospitals across the world, 80% of people were receiving antibiotics. And most of those were receiving antibiotics empirically um, on admission to hospital. So once again, there is this huge imbalance between uh, the actual number of bacterial infections, co-infections in this viral disease of COVID 
and the amount of people getting antibiotics. So once again, viral disease is driving um, antimicrobial resistance, potentially. One of the drivers, as we know, is our inability to um, adequately diagnose bacterial infection. And one of the things that COVID has shown us is just how quickly diagnostic tests, including rapid diagnostic tests, can actually be generated and be given access across the world um, in stark contrast to our um, really poor uh, development of diagnostics for AMR. Now, appreciating that these are different, uh, two different types of pathogen uh, and different issues. However, it's a stark reminder of the importance of being able to diagnose and one of the drivers of uh, inappropriate antibiotic use being an inability to actually prove that there isn't an anti, isn't a bacterial infection that requires antibiotics. And even the genotyping that's been taking place and showing variants of concern across the world, which are resistant, uh, perhaps even to some of our vaccines, again, draws parallels with uh, what we've been able to achieve in COVID uh, in terms of our new knowledge and diagnostics and uh, uh, sequencing, and really our lack of movement forward in AMR. Now, being on the front line in the beginning of COVID, and this on your left is the first case announced in South Africa in March, really felt very much like our modern day problems with AMR in so much as we had nothing to offer. You know, patients were coming in with severe COVID pneumonia, um, dying with, at that stage, just um, basically just oxygen and perhaps some drugs which we had no idea whether they worked. At the same time, a couple of weeks ago in my hospital, this pan-resistant Acinetobacter Balmani of the knee in a patient with prosthetic joint infection, um, totally untreatable, and the patient had to have an amputation to control the infection. There was nothing to offer. And this was very much like what was happening in the early days of COVID. And again, it's ironic that in fact, what we've seen in COVID to date um, is despite some new options being available. It's the old workhorse drugs, oxygen and dexamethasone, that have made the huge difference in COVID-19 management. And the parallel here with uh, old antibiotics, the penicillins, the workhorses, which so much of the, there's so much of a problem of accessing. They're not sexy, they're not new, and they're not pricey. But it's the old antibiotics that we need to look to, and maybe COVID-19 is tipping a hat to that. The other issue that in the hospital environment and what we found particularly, and I think across the world, is isn't it amazing when a single purpose can drive an amazing team approach? So at Hurskir Hospital, where I work, at the height of the pandemic, even the first wave, we had over 500 different doc doctors from different, all the different specialties, all working on COVID wards and admission services to a single purpose. Now relate that to antimicrobial resistance, where we're still talking to a very few people who really understand about AMR, are invested in AMR and working together. And we need to learn about this from what we can take from COVID and the team approach, how we can move forward. The other part, antimicrobial resistance, obviously the mitigate, to mitigate it, we looked at antimicrobial stewardship and we looked to its bedfellow, infection prevention and control. And particularly in the hospital environments and our desire in COVID to apply, apply and adhere to infection prevention control was I think largely driven by fear for the self. We were worried and fearful for our own safety. Now, IPC is appallingly done in most countries and in particular in low middle income countries in relation to reducing bacteria or transfer of bacteria between patients because it's not driven by fear for the self. That would have to be driven by fear for the patients. And altruistic as we may like to think we are, unfortunately, fear to the self trumps altruism. And I think we need to understand what drives us with the IPC. It's so important in antimicrobial resistance to get IPC right. And we haven't done that. The other issue is that in terms of fear for the self, 
On the other hand, uh, on the, in the same sort of vein, sorry, we look in antimicrobial resistance to the threat of death and destruction in the future. So the, the fear of the threat in the future is not the same as the fear and the threat at the present time. And that also seems to have come, come shining through. People dissociate from futuristic predictions and Wellcome Trust study showed that around the time of the O'Neill report. Now think about this daily graph, this daily, uh, these daily images that one's seeing which are so powerful in real time to show us where the epidemic is for pandemic is for COVID-19. We have nothing like this for antimicrobial resistance, but how powerful that would be. Despite the problems with data, we have the potential to actually make this sort of, these sort of graphics for bacterial resistant infections or AMR in real time to understand the threat. And this has also shown us again just how important surveillance is and how poor our surveillance is in so many parts of the world and that is problematic and something we need to attend to so if you're expecting anything further on this slide i'm afraid you're going to be disappointed because this does depict the face of amr now close your eyes and think about the images of covid and you will know what covid looks like and the public will know what covid looks like we still face the ultimate challenge that we do not see a face of amr and therefore again the threat and the drivers and everything that moves people towards actually doing something about a problem is missing and if we don't change this to an actual graphic or things that we can purposefully see, then we're going to have problems going forward and continue problems. So what I've hoped to try and do is show how the COVID pandemic has shone a light on our problems that we face in mitigating antimicrobial resistance. It's been an instructive 14 or 15 months, a terrible time, but also the best of times. And if we can somehow harness the lessons that we have had from COVID to apply to antimicrobial resistance, I think we will be taking our problem of AMR uh, forward a lot. And I'm going to stop there and thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Mark. That was a fantastic presentation, really showing some of the uh, similarities and potential. I did just want to ask you one question, because you said that uh, we are ironically seeing a virus that's potentially driving antibiotic uh, resistance. And there's been lots of questions about whether COVID is exacerbating antibiotic uh, resistance. Uh, what data do we do we have, or is it to, is the jury still out on that one? I think the jury's still out on that one. I think people are accumulating. Hopefully, we'll be accumulating data on what the patterns of antibiotic resistance look like. Um, it's not only antibiotic resistance, of course. AMR being all microbes. I mean, we saw in South Africa during the pandemic a reduction of 50 percent in TB diagnoses, and that includes obviously drug resistant TB diagnoses. So we have, you know, it's across the board antiretroviral resistance. So these um, these figures aren't there yet, but we do know that this massive drive of uh, increased use of antibiotics is highly likely to increase uh, the pool of antimicrobial resistant, antibiotic resistant bacteria. And certainly we've seen a number of cases who have had antibiotics on admission with uh, empirically unnecessary in COVID. And then they're in hospital stay, they have picked up a antibiotic resistant bacteria or it's been selected out by the use of the initial antibiotic. So, uh, you know, we have the data still needs to be shown, but I think it's almost certain that this has impacted negatively on uh, or uh, impacted on our antibiotic resistance rates. Thank you, Mark, for that. I'd like to now um, hand over to Dr. Joanne Liu, because uh, Joanne wears many, many hats. And one of those hats is that she's on the panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response, which is going to report its findings to the World Health Assembly in May. So, uh, Joanne, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, Claire, and uh, good day, everybody. It's my pleasure to join you today on this panel. <clears throat> so what I would like to do is, it's, um, first of all, start with uh, some of the uh, early finding of uh, the uh, independent panel. Right. And um, the independent panel, just to be clear, is an independent panel that was commissioned by the member state of WHO to basically evaluate the response of WHO to COVID-19 as well as the member states. And so we released an interim report on uh, January 19 at the uh, executive board of WHO. And um, I think what is interesting about COVID-19, if you if if you do the comparison with um, with AMR, is the fact that it's a contracted time in terms of a timeline of of, of event. So um, everything happens fairly quickly uh, with COVID-19. So I think that our very first finding is is the fact that, and I think that it's no scoop. The world was not prepared. And um, we knew that, we've been saying that for decades, but I think that we didn't know to which extent the world was not prepared. And we didn't even have the tool to figure out how prepared we were. Actually, the indicator of global uh, pandemic index uh, was not adequate because the country that scored the best were countries that actually have done the worst. Uh, and, and it's a country like the US, it's a country like UK. So, so we did not as well the right to, tools to project you know, what would be the response. Mm. So early on, there's been a, a cascade of early find, uh, failings in terms of uh, detection, alert, and response. So I think in terms of detection, what we have to highlight is the fact that fairly early on, I think the suspicion that there were human to human transmission was there. And I think that um, there should have been, a, a, I would say, a warning that suspicion of human to human transmission was there. And the principle of precaution should have been applied in terms of trying to mitigate the, the impact of human to human transmission early on. The other thing is about the alert. So if you compare, for example, to the Ebola epidemic in 2014, 2016, it took it took didn't take months to declare the public health emergency of international concerns for a few weeks. And and we have improved markedly. Maybe we could have done it, you know, a few days er, earlier, but actually marked improvement. But I think where we've been really, really uh, I would say um um disarticulate and 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 weak is is on the response. It's basically we detected something. The alert has been wrong. And it's like being, you know, at school when the fire alarm goes off and everybody is sitting on their seat and they're wondering if it's a drill. That's basically what member states have done from several weeks, from few days to four to eight weeks for most of the country in the global north. So um that that this is where that you let a head start to a virus to run loose. So um, the other thing that uh, I think that the, the interim report is, is pretty uh, strikely in and everybody talks about it, it's how it has exacerbated laid bare the inequities. We know that number of increase of, of poor people you know, that's gonna be joining uh, uh, that are now below the, the poverty line is more than 100 million people. We know it has affected more some particular subpopulation, especially women in terms because of informal work, because of their carers. But um, I think that what I wanted to put the emphasis on is really on the fact that um, it, on the on the access to essential uh, to essential equipment or essential medicine, and and basically um, there was no no framework, there was no way how to do that. It's basically uh, it was it was led led to uh, the nation who had the most power purchase got the most basically. So it was a full far west. And uh, and so, uh, as we know, we're so deeply and complexly interconnected and interdependent that uh, we cannot only fight in one corner of the world, COVID-19, we need to fight it everywhere equally and we need to arrive at the, at the finish line at the same time. So, um, and the other thing that, that uh, and we talked about it and now uh, I think 
on, over the last few days, there was some remarkable, I would say, breakthrough, uh, but it's about ACTA. So this is this, is this um, innovative new platform to finance and, uh, and basically uh, uh, imagine uh, innovation for, um, for diagnostic, for treatment, and for vaccine. And the one that we heard the most is about vaccine, which is COVAX. And over the last week, it delivered more than, than 10 million uh, vaccine in low and middle income countries. So that, that, is, that is great. But I think what I would like to, to, to put a spotlight a little bit on is how it was imagined. And, and the fact that um, at its inception, conception, it was basically what I call a bit of a country club, uh, aristocracy of global health who sat together and just said, how can we imagine the mechanism to make sure that everybody gets something somehow? And this is how they created the platform. And, and it's, um, it's, it's not a bad idea. Uh, on the other hand, um, there's something that you find it very disturbing is the fact that it's so non-inclusive. And it's a bit, you know, the phenomenon of what I call um, the hick planning. After the men's planning, men telling us what to do. Now you have the high-income country telling us, the low-middle-income country, what we should do. And and the fundamental flaw of that is that if you have a platform that is is there to drive the innovation, and you don't have a good part of the planet not sitting around the table um, and and being involved in the thinking, it is unlikely that the outcome and the product will fit uh, the context of those countries. So, so we need to seize this opportunity now to, uh, to, to make some change uh, in terms of, and, and uh, Mark alluded to it, about, about manufacturing. And, uh, and I think that, uh, that this uh, might be an opportunity if we want so, uh, but it means that we're going to need to rethink uh, how we drive uh, how we drive innovation, and and from end to end, from the conception until that it gets to, to the people who need either the vaccine, the treatment, or the therapeutic. And so um, and so, I think we need to reflect on on uh, on how we subject those public health tools to what I call a liberal free market, and how can we somehow firewall it that, that it, it's, it becomes a real common good. Uh, so that's one thing. I think the other thing as well is, is to, to make sure that um, if we are to create other platform for, for, uh, for the future, is how to make sure that we are inclusive, but not inclusive of the low and middle income country, but as well, I find, of, uh, of other nations who are right now active actors. And if we take, for example, the vaccine, there's two countries who have put forward and more than, than two countries, but the one that we're talking a lot about is Russia and China. And they are right now, uh, I would say, deploying their vaccine in different countries. And how does it come and how does it complement or not the other initiative about vaccine? So um, I think that it's, uh, it's important to see you know, how can we imagine a reset in terms of, uh, of, of access? So where does it take us for AMR? Well, I think there's, there's a lot of lessons to be learned, and um, I, everybody talks about the one health, but what I'd like to talk more is about the, the, the one world, is we cannot and we will not imagine the right tools and the right way to respond to global um, bio threat or global health threat if we are always, I would say, imagining uh, and, and conceptualizing response with only few people, uh, I would say, invited at the table to discuss it. So uh, we need to have the world come together in terms of the high and the middle income country to imagine what would be the next, I would say, platform and way forward to tackle, um, uh, I would say, threat like, uh, like AMR. The other thing is, is I think that, um, uh, Will it be the reality check that we need it, you know, to address a uh, pandemic? I'm not totally sure, but I think if we want to get there, I think we need to change a bit of our mindset. And I think uh, it's, it's, I think it's important that um, global health threat, like COVID-19, like, uh, like AMR, 
needs to be raised at the level of existential threat, like a chemical weapon or like um, like a, a nuclear um, accident. It needs to be our Chernobyl moment uh, about uh, what happened to make sure that uh, for the next pandemic to come or the one that we're currently fighting, like AMR, that we are putting, uh, I would say, the, our best, I would say, reflection, our best tool and our, our best political will to tackle it. So, um, so for me, this is what I see at, at, at the macro level. And I would, just, I would finish on that note, it's at the micro level. Um, I've been working in an ER and I've been working as well in long-term care facilities in, in Canada. And I think that um, at the micro level, uh, what we learn as well is, is that um, it's awful. It's awful to die alone. And I think that we should make that commitment that no patient should be dying alone with people wearing uh, wearing uh, PPE, a cosmonaut kit to protect themselves. Honestly, I don't think that a high pad can hold someone's hand when they're dying. And we should make that commitment that this will not happen again with AMR. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Joanne, really, for some really thought-provoking statements there about uh, our Chernobyl moment and indeed to seize the opportunity for AMR. And let me please encourage everybody to start submitting questions because uh, we want as many questions as possible to our speakers. And we, what struck me again there, uh, Joanne, was this uh, your wonderful image of the fire drill and that we just didn't know how unprepared we are. So let me bring in uh, Manika uh, from Guard P because Guard P has written a report about uh, what lessons can be learned from COVID for tackling AMR. And that last point that was in Joanne's uh, presentation there that governments must find a way to improve preparedness and response. I mean, what steps can governments take, do you think, uh, Manika? Yeah, thank you very much, Claire. And really, I want to say it's very hard to follow two really wonderful uh, and excellent interventions. And I think some of them comments there really, really hit home, both from a kind of global and policy perspective and, and really also in a very practical perspective on at the ground level. Um, I just want to make a few observations, really, also based on, on the report that we published um, recently. Uh, and also pick up on a few points that were made uh, actually by both speakers that indeed I think there is a lot that we do need to learn this really has to be a kind of Chernobyl moment um, and I think there's there's certain things from COVID-19 that we really need to take forward when we think about drug resistant infections the first that has been said many times you know drug resistant infections are a silent um, pandemic um, and, you know, as, as everyone who knows this area, we're not just talking about one infection, but multiple different infections being played out in many different ways. The second is that, you know, we learned from COVID-19 that access to countermeasures are extremely important. Uh, and we need to apply that. Uh, if we want to deal with drug, deal with drug re resistant infections, we need to look at access to countermeasures that are developed against drug resistant infections. Uh, and we also have to remember that in the case of antibiotics, whether even if they are inappropriately used, we still do need effective antibiotics to always treat a subset of patients uh, in any viral pandemic due to, to secondary uh, infections and complications. But the third point to also make is that uh, is to really also follow up on, on what Mark said, that unfortunately, indeed, um, uh, antibiotic prescriptions have substantially increased during a viral pandemic. It's not surprising. Um, and, you know, I think, unfortunately, we need to see how this is going to play out uh, in the subsequent months and years ahead uh, and what impact this will have uh, in uh, medical care and public health. Um, in terms of recommendations for governments, and I'm, I'm really going to focus this more in the kind of um, biomedical tools uh, perspective and not more broadly, because otherwise that they, there really would be a lot more that one can say, but just on the perspective of the development of countermeasures or drugs or diagnostics or vaccines. There are certain things that we've seen from COVID as just as an example that we should really be applying. First, that we really do need to recognize and address the problem urgently. And as Mark showed, 
you know, the way that we have been, we, we've really quite magically developed in, in record speed vaccines and diagnostics, once we've realized the urgency, the problem shows that this can be done. And yet, if you look at how we um, look at uh, simple tools um, that could be available that could make a difference in how we use and apply uh, antibiotics, um, better diagnostics, um, you know, uh, uh, continued uh, innovation in the, in the field of drugs, but also for infection prevention control, um, we have a far way to go. So recognizing and putting some sense of urgency that we have to deal with the infection of drug resistant, uh, the, the problem of drug resistant infections is, is important. Um, we therefore do have to develop and invest in the development of, of what we, or what is called countermeasures. Um, uh, but more importantly, I think we have to ensure access uh, and we have to ensure equitable access. And this is important because, you know, as we, as we see now, it's, it's not really very effective to spend billions of dollars developing drugs or vaccines or any other um, tool if at the end you apply these tools in, in a very kind of uh, inadequate or inappropriate or inequitable way. Uh, and so it's absolutely uh, vital that we look at access um, to um, new tools and to improve tools or even existing tools if we want to, to address the, pan, um, the, the issue of drug resistant infections. Fourthly, I would say expanding global cooperation across geographies and within a one health framework. And I think Joanne was also very right to call out the, the, um, the, 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 the need to look at this as, as a one world uh, framework, actually. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I totally subscribe to her point that, you know, um, the phenomena of explaining can be quite problematic. Actually, you know, in, in, in AMR, there is, of course, a danger of not being inclusive particularly to low and middle income countries that really should be seen as equal partners in a comprehensive global response. I think now countries, even high income countries recognize that there's real value in being more inclusive because there's a lot that you can learn from each other. Um, different approaches are taken in different contexts and sometimes um, I think we can learn from what others are doing in different parts of the world. But also simply that, you know, making decisions broadly when often you're not best placed to have an understanding on what kind of decisions need to be made um, is is another component of it. Um, I would say uh, close off by saying you know just a couple more statements around um, pandemic preparedness because I think what we need to see uh, AMR is as we said it's a silent pandemic and therefore we need to apply you know I think all the kind of lessons we've learned about pandemic preparedness now to AMR. Um, we also have to remember that antibiotics are going to be a critical component in pandemic preparedness in the future, whatever way we look at it. We need antibiotics, effective antibiotics to address future health threats. We need to address um, the problem of drug resistant infections in its, in its own right. Um, but we also need to ensure that um, we really need to, uh, to, to, to see that this is applied evenly uh, across the world and that countries um, are engaged. I will wanna pick up on one point that what Mark said, that we often focus on innovation and we forget about the basics. There's, there is across the world now shortages of many important old antibiotics. And this in, in fact drives uh, further inappropriate use. So I think it's extremely important that we look at ensuring that um, existing tools, the bread and butter, what we need to address um, these pa pandemics are, are available. So I'll, I'll stop there and um, you know, thank you very much for um, giving me the chance to uh, make this uh, interventions. And once again, I would really like to thank our our previous presenters for, for really their excellent points. Uh, thank you, Manika. And indeed, one of the threads that is definitely coming out here is this lack of equitable access. I think Joanne highlighted that very uh, clearly and the concerns about the low and middle income countries. Now, I, I wanted to drill down a little bit, Manika, because you were mentioning that we've got to ensure access to diagnostics, treatments and vaccines for all. Um, so you know, can you tell us a bit, because there's an initiative, isn't there, that's being created at the moment. I know it's early days, but it is to try and get access for all of uh, some of these countermeasures. What, what can you tell us on that? Yeah, we, as Guard P, I mean, we're, we're a foundation that's committed not just to accelerating the development of new tools and particularly uh, antimicrobials, but also looking at access. And one of the things we've been looking at is why are we seeing problems with access to antibiotics? On the one hand, that uh, a lot of new antibiotics are being developed and 
uh, often they're only made available to a handful of countries uh, around say 10, 12 countries. Uh, uh, but then there's also a shortage of many old and existing antibiotics that are absolutely um, necessary, I think, and, and should be available in healthcare systems. And so we started looking at what are the, what are the kind of background problems of that and start to put together with a bunch of partners, you know, what are some practical interventions that we can do to address this, um, ranging from how can we support um, um, registration and market authorization of antibiotics where they, they've only been um, made available in a, in a limited number of countries, to how we can also generate evidence to uh, ensure um, that we can uh, we can have antibiotics being used appropriately and effectively. Um, that's just a comment to say that many antibiotics are developed for very specific indications, but often their real value would be for for other things. Uh, and then there are also populations like like newborns and children that are often um, left unaddressed, and often um, there are antibiotics that are never really targeted for these populations. And we also need to ensure that utilizing evidence and generating new evidence that we can develop appropriate guidelines for use. And the issue around stewardship is important, but this has to be evidence-based and data-driven. But unfortunately, in this space, there's relatively little evidence actually being generated. Uh, and when where, where, and where data is generated, often this is not available. And the last uh, point to make is that we do th need to think about how we can facilitate availability either through um, manufacturing, um, and either through how we can um, simplify or uh, uh, look at different uh, schemes for procurement, both of old and new antibiotics, how we can look at consolidating demand to prevent issues around shortages and so on. So we are putting together these components um, within a, a kind of project um, and uh, really looking at how we can and promote and enhance um, access. But I want to emphasize that it, this is initially focusing on antibiotics and is looking both at old and, 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 and new antibiotics. Um, I would end by just saying that these kind of, I think, initiatives are very important, but at the end of the day, we really need politi political willingness and support and recognition um, that there is a problem and that, that things need to be done. Yes, and uh, obviously the the issue is also making the business case uh, for some of these uh, antibiotics because uh, they're not always, uh, you know, they're used as a, in the last uh, resort. So it's finding a payment uh, model that can be used, whether it's a subscription model or other models, so that you actually do have enough for people. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Of course, you know every, this is kind of well documented that indeed, you know that 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 it's a, it's a kind of broken market. But it's also important to understand that this is one component to it. I think it's important that there are incentives to really um, support research and development. But these need to be uh, really kind of twinned with the objectives around access, because again, it, you, you can pump a lot of money into the system, but if you fail in your last hurdles, um, you're really not going to kind of do what you're meant to do. And you, one has to ask the question, what, what is our objective here when we start a project on antibiotics or invest money in developing new antibiotics? What is the end game that we want to achieve? And of course, incentives are something that can really be an important enabler. But it, to, to someone like me as a, as a public health physician and a clinician, the end game is something that goes to the next step. And we need to ensure that we do the other things to, to make sure we get to the end game. Indeed, in COVID-19, we're, we're very much seeing that. That's been a huge and tremendous effort that really needs to be recognized on bringing a lot of actors together, both public and private sector, and, and really um, you know, doing innovation at lightning speed. But we actually find that what we also need to think about is how are we going to make sure that all these tools are accessible where they're needed? Uh, and this is not easy during a pandemic when things are in constant fluctuation uh, and change. Thank you, Manika. I just wanted to pick up on uh, something that you were talking about, stewardship. Uh, Mark, in your presentation, you think I, you said, if I'm quoting you correctly, uh, the, uh, the uh, infection prevention and control has been appalling in uh, most uh, hospitals. And I'm just wondering, with COVID, do you think that's changed people's views on the importance of uh, IPC and in hospitals? Have people become more aware? Well, they have, but as I, uh, what I was trying to say, I guess, is that, you know, that awareness and the practice of um, good infection control really around COVID has been about fear to the self so that they, you know, have been compliant with the different um, types of personal protective equipment and all the administrative and environmental issues that go along with infection prevention. 
Um, I mean, what, we, what we've also seen compliance in is an international compliance, thankfully, of a real understanding of the importance of vaccination as prevention. And in AMR, you know, that is equally important, yet um, despite being not bad at uh, extended programs of immunization in children, uh, adult immunization programs, for example, which could impact greatly on, um, on antibiotic resistance by reducing bacterial infections and viral infections really is lacking. So while I would love to think that this this increase in infection prevention control adherence within hospitals is going to last. Sadly, when you sort of sit on a ward and look at what's happening, uh, people go back to their old ways. And we have to find a way of actually changing this uh, once and for all. And that's not simple, but uh, I think that, that it's possible. Yeah. Um, Joanne, I wanted to pick up on something that you said, because, you know, COVID, as we all know, it goes without saying, it's had such awful uh, health, uh, social, political, financial impacts that, you know, would this be a wake up call now for governments uh, concerning pr uh, pandemic preparedness? And I think I heard you say that you weren't sure that it would be a, a, a wake up call. C could, could you elaborate on that? Well, my heart as a, as a doctor and humanitarian, I really wish it would be the wake up call. I think that my, um, my fear, and I think it will echo what as Mark just said, is, is people would be so happy to get out of the wood of COVID-19 that they, they would want to move on. And, and this is often what happened when you have such a big trauma uh, and, and it's been traumatizing, is the fact that somehow part of you wants to forget. So how are we going to create an environment to not forget? Uh, I think we have 2.5 million reasons to not forget of the lost life, but how are we going to create that to that, that it is going to stay with people? And, and, and it, it, the thing is, and this is why in the thick of it, we need to basically beat, beat the iron while, while it's hot and, and, and make people to, to commit to something a little bit more comprehensive because, um, we, we've seen it in the past. We, we unfortunately have, a, I would say, a, the greatest talent of, of attention deficit. Uh, so once things, uh, once the big threat is not right in front of us, we're moving on. And we, we want to move on because we want to relaunch the economy. We want to reopen the society. We would just want to just go on. And so the responsible way to, to make sure that that, that government um, and uh, make that this comment is to do it while they still have it in their daily day life and just say, can we come up with some sort of a pre-negotiated, you know, agreement, some people call it maybe treaty, to just say, um, this has put the planet on its knee, you know, in, in all, you know, sectors, everybody, at work, but at personal level, were affected by COVID-19. Can we make a deal now before we forget, and then and then stick to it to a certain extent? And and this is why I was talking about raising it to the level of an existential threat, because like we do with 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 chemical weapon or with with um, with nuclear accident, is the fact that people say the threat is so is so perceived as massive that people are ready to give a little bit away some of their sovereignty. They want to help further they, because, as I say, we can only fight this together. And this is this kind of, of moment that we have to create in people's mind. And, 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 and then after that, translate it in real political action. Yeah, absolutely. Seizing the moment. And I and I want to bring in Mark and Manika about uh, that and making sure that, you know, policymakers really put it up the agenda. Mark, I just, uh, you know, that presentation was so powerful when you had that slide, which was AMR, silent pandemic and nothing on the slide. And that's almost the problem, isn't it? The way we communicate on this. And as you say, it's seen as a threat in the future. Uh, 2050. So I, I wondered whether you had any more thoughts on, you know, to elaborate on what you just said on how to communicate, uh, perhaps Manika also, and yeah, how do we get uh, policymakers not to move on, as Joanne says, but to 
to, to make this a priority? If I come to Mark and then to Manika. So I think jo Joanne's absolutely right. You know, the cri it's critical now to act with speed. And the problem, again, as, as Joanne uh, quite rightly said, is that everybody's so focused on COVID, we're not out of the woods anywhere close yet. Um, but that's a real problem. And in, in AMR, we also, we had a sort of, we peaked uh, a few years ago at the U UN General Assembly high level meeting in terms of sort of global governance. And things, you know, although there are now the, 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 the global leaders group and uh, there, there will be other groups, and there are wonderful organizations like Guard P and Carbex and others that are really pushing agendas. I think there, you know, there's a problem with global leadership. Now, the, just to say that I think that there are a few things that have happened in during this COVID pandemic in the last year that really need to be seized on and, and brought forward into AMR. The first is that you know, we have seen the value uh, and the ability to, to do massive multi-center, multi-country trials, um, adaptive trials, um, you know, in a pandemic. I mean, if we can do that, for goodness sake, I mean, can't we do that within in antibiotic, you know, uh, uh, antibiotic prescribing? And there are multiple questions around antibiotic use that could be used. I think the other major tool and the major um, sort of thing that has come out of of, uh, of COVID is, is as Joanna and Manika both sort of highlighted, is this equitable access sort of uh, ACTA, COVAX, et cetera. You know, the, the, time, the time for the apologism, you know, the apologetic uh, nature of, um, of, of, the, of the whole of global health has got to change. Low, low middle income countries, as Joanne said, you know, can no longer be bystanders or recipients. We must be partners. And, and that plays into this issue of access and the issue of the ACTA. And these are things that we could be piggybacked to use more appropriately, uh, more strongly in AMR. And I'd really like to, to see that. The time has gone where low middle income countries are part, are just recipients. We, we have to be partners now and we have to increase our voice uh, in this. Hmm. Thank you, Manika. If you'd like to reflect on either what Mark or Joanne said, but I think the issue, isn't it, is how do we keep yeah. the momentum going from, from yeah. COVID? And then yeah. I'll take some questions from the audience. Yeah, yeah I, I just want to pick up on what Mark said because, you know, I, I, and reflecting on the last few years of just doing my own job, um, you know, sometimes you almost feel like you're asking people for a favor to say, we would like to do and you know expand antibiotic development in these areas as almost like they were leftover areas that were somehow you know secondary of of, of importance a, a very good example is our, our work that we do on 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 neonates and pediatrics i mean as if developing antibiotics for children is a is an after is an indulgent afterthought that we do no i mean this is if you just look add up the numbers and look at who's actually impacted you would be investing heavily in infection prevention control and development of countermeasures for this population alone, uh, probably even prioritized over other populations. But one has to take an approach of almost playing it that, you know, well, this is important and so on and so forth. And it, it is frustrating, I think, after a while. Similarly, you know, why should we, why should one think about, you know, ensuring access in, in, in low middle income countries for, for new antibiotics or even to ensure long term supply of some older antibiotics? Actually, this is also a problem in some high income countries. Um, but uh, again, it's almost seen as an afterthought. And I, I think it's very frustrating to try and explain repeatedly that actually you'll just, just do it in your own self-interest because if you actually want to think about a response in a pandemic, you can't, you can't see yourself out of the woods if you take a very kind of insular approach. It just doesn't work that way. And I think COVID has been in a way, a very easy way to explain that. I mean, everyone can see now how obvious that is. While before, when you were saying it, people just thought you were just saying stuff to, to you know, get what you want. Uh, and I think um, those, those things really do have to be picked up. There has to be a reckoning and a reformulation of how we do governance in global health. Um, I, I just think that the way that we're doing it before is, is, is not, it's not fit for purpose, if I'm, if I'm brutally honest. Um, but I also think that we also have to think about be, beyond business as usual, because the business as usual approach by definition, cannot work in an emergency. Uh, otherwise, 
if, if you're using a business as usual approach, at least if you at some level haven't recognized you're living through an emergency. And so I, I actually would put that point forward to say, if you want to deal with any pandemic, which by nature should be treated as an emergency of some sort, even if it's a more slow burning one, you do need to think about, uh, you know, approaches that are just not business as usual and not the, uh, a conventional approach. And finally, I would just add the, the, the point uh, that Joanne said, you have to kind of um, utilize the moment. And, and unfortunately, we're not out of COVID-19. So people have very little bandwidth to really look at other issues like antimicrobial resistance. But in fact, we, we really have to have this discussion now. Uh, it really is necessary in a way because we are living the moment. We, it somehow can get some appreciation of how important it is. Because as Joanne said, once we're out of the moment, it is a natural human instinct to try and forget and move on. Um, but we'll never move on if we have to face another crisis in a few years. So we really have to kind of bite the bullet now and start working towards uh, a framework where we can uh, deal with pandemics in, in a better way, in a more effective way, in a more proactive way going forward. Well, thank you. I, as I said, I'm now going to take some of the questions from the audience. And what I would just like uh, to ask Mark, Manika and Joanne is just to raise your hand if you want to add, uh, because I'm going to throw to, you know, the person that I think is most obvious. But if you want to chip in, please uh, do and just give me a visual cue. So we've got a question here from Christy Nortier from the Daily Maverick in South Africa. Uh, I don't know whether Mark can tell us what the Daily Maverick is, but this is a question which I would automatically put to Joanne uh, with her former MSF hat on, which is how can civil society organizations help to carry these lessons forward? Uh, Joanne, let's start with you on that one. Right, um, thank you very much for the question. Well, I think that, um, I think the, the civil society will will uh, will have to see if they organize themselves and if they demand things. And then at this stage, uh, I, I I know how it is in South Africa, but but in, in in the part of the world where I am, it's been very centralized and very really top down approach. And and somehow, um, as we always say, an epidemic starts in the community and stops in the community. And so community needs to own the uh, the epidemic and 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 to a certain extent I think that uh, for some people in part of of uh, society um, it, it's like the slide that you 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 put uh, um, Mark it's faceless it's a, a, ther th a theoretical thing it's just like we know that some people who are in a hospital but actually like in Canada people just say oh it's only the elderly uh, but us the young the strong it doesn't affect us. And so it's not my problem. Well, it's all our problem. So there's, there's a question of ownership. And, and, and this is why uh, until um, I would say uh, the community, the society is involved and fully involved and, and, and part of the response, I don't think we're gonna be able to beat uh, uh, out uh, COVID-19. Yeah, thank you. Um, if I'm not getting any visual cues from the others, I'm going to move on to another question. Uh, in fact, this question is for Mark Mandelson and you also, Joanne. It is, is it possible to produce rapid diagnostic tools that can efficiently rule out multiple differential presentations? Uh, so let me ask that one to Mark and then to uh, Joanne. Um, okay, so... So the answer, the answer is theoretically yes. Um, there are already platforms which are generally termed as multiplex um, platforms, often um, around uh, multiplex PCR, particular you know, um, uh, ways of finding genetic material of different pathogens. There are viral panels, bacterial panels, and sometimes sort of a, a mixture. Um, the problem is that you have to have the right specimen and, uh, you know, it depends on the clinical presentation and very, very many things. But, but more than that, I, you know, I think that one of the problems is that we don't even use the rapid diagnostic tests that we've got at the moment and for many reasons. So, I mean, the holy grail in, in all of this is really getting a test which doctors or prescribers would be really confident in 
um, to make the differentiation between a bacterium and a virus. So if you had a definite test that you could tell um, it was that there wasn't a, a bacteria there, there was a virus, that's a game changer because so many of the of our antibiotic prescriptions are for viral infections are because of this issue. But I mean, in many, in certain diseases, certain presentations of disease, um, the the use of a basic C-reactive protein, CRP, for which there is a point of care test already, has been shown in, in a number of settings to be able to reduce antibody prescribing. Yet in most low income countries, that is just not attainable. And part of it is because certainly in the private sectors in South Africa, for example, medical aids won't pay for um, a point of care rapid diagnostic test and only pay for a laboratory one. So, and in the public system, it's just not, uh, you know, affordable. So how do we bring down prices to, you know, from maybe 300 Rand to five Rand, um, you know, or a, a, a dollar to 20 cents um, for tests that we've already got? So yes, I think technology is moving forward that we will hopefully get there. The longitude pride hasn't, hasn't been claimed yet. Um, and I, I hope we will, it will come to pass. But yes, theoretically, we can do it. There are some platforms, but we're not even using the things that we've, we've got uh, for us. So that would be my suggestion. Yeah, Joanne, would you like to add anything uh, to Mark's uh, response to that one? No, I'm, I'm good. I'm going to pass on that one. <laughs> okay, there's an, there's another one also here, um, either to Mark or uh, Joanne. Uh, speaking to your comment about the older generation of antibiotics, I mean, this was uh, Mark here. How can we compel biotechnology corporations to coordinate or cooperate and avoid patenting protections, preventing open source sharing, avoiding privatization of AMR research? Let me go to Mark and Joanne, if you want to pick up, let me know. Well, I'm very happy for Joanne to take this, but actually my answer would be, uh, Manika, could you please give us your answer? Because this is the man who, <laughs> with the plan. It's a very good question and a, complicate, a complex question. Uh, we, we need to be able to ensure that old antibiotics become cost effective for companies to be able to produce or there is a body that buys out to ensure that that happens. But really, I mean, Joanne, I'm sure has thoughts, but Manika, I would uh, definitely ask you. Uh, OK, let, let, let me go to Manika and then back to Joanne and then we'll move on to another question. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think in, in the, you know, there is, as, as we alluded to earlier, there is uh, significant issues around the, what we were saying in the antibiotic market, if that's a way of putting it. Um, you know, I, I think um, both in terms of um, what is seen as the, uh, the, the profitability of developing new antibiotics or lack of, and at the same time, you know, um, the commercial viability of even some old antibiotics. And in that sense, it doesn't really matter whether the drug is patented or not, because you have a problem even with supply of some, some old antibiotics. And this, this is very complex in nature. Uh, sometimes it's also due to the fact that the raw materials of the antibiotics are made by very, very, very few people in certain parts of the world. And so if something goes wrong there, you, you have a knock-on effect in, in the whole um, value chain, and um, then you can face a shortage of an antibiotic for a, an extended period of time. And unfortunately, that just means that, that clinicians or, or healthcare workers have to then utilize other uh, uh, antibiotics, often inappropriately, um, and that, that, is a, that is a major problem. But I would make a more general point, which is I actually think there's a lot more mileage from some of the older antibiotics that we have, and we should probably be thinking more carefully about how to use them or, and, and, and I think even repurpose them. Um, and certainly be looking at longer term supply security of, of these antibiotics. We need to see it in a different light and maybe the traditional business model of how one uses and pays for antibiotics should be changed. In a way, we need to have antibiotics as a form of, of health security. They need to be there in the health system. Uh, and it's often difficult to justify why you would say have a drug that you may or may not use, particularly with a second or third line antibiotic. But nonetheless, if we know how to use these antibiotics well, and that's also, as I said earlier, part of the problem. Um, but if we do know how to use these antibiotics, you should be able to ensure that these antibiotics are there the ones that are commonly used, and there there needs to be much more instruction around um, the use and stewardship of these antibiotics, as Mark alluded to. 
but even the ones that may not be needed to be used um, very often, uh, but they, they, they are the ones that can actually save lives uh, because you have to use them at, at very, for very critical cases or where you have very little uh, alternatives. Um, and I think this is this is the problem that we face. So I think one of the things we do need to think about is what is this, what is a strategic portfolio of antibiotics for the world, uh, and how do we deploy that and and really see it as a common resource or as a common good. Um, uh, uh, so I think that that maybe is a change of mindset that is required by all actors actually, uh, and not just one one sector. Joanne, the question was also addressed to you, so I don't know whether you want to give, as we say, your two pennyworth and to uh, put your input into this about the older generation of antibiotics and how to compel biotechnology uh, companies uh, to coordinate and cooperate on this um, and avoid what they're calling the privatization of AMR research. I don't think I have much to add to my my two colleagues. Um, I I think that uh, I think for me it's 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 where I would like to put the emphasis is is really on on how do we uh, how do we create common good and and how do how do we make it you know um, not only the lip service uh, but until the end because there's there's this thing about um, that we we make those scheme of of wanting to 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 use public funds to for research and innovation, but when it comes a product, all of a sudden it's 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 not as seen as a common uh, a common good anymore, and and then it, and then comes into all you know the I would say the legislation aspect, and and all of a sudden you have those massive roadblocks that you you you're not able to to overcome with 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 uh, the international. The, the intellectual property and all that. So, so there needs to be, I would say, um, a, a deep will to change the mechanic of that, and then and then follow through. Because often when we we, we start a, an, an initiative, uh, we're very happy, we're proud of ourselves, and we self celebrate ourselves. But when to, we need to follow through to make sure that that it's a it's an enacted access for all. And and we haven't been too good so far, unfortunately. Uh, yes, Mark, and then Manica. So Claire, I was just thinking as you you know you're speaking and, and just tying in this issue of you know the pharmaceutical companies and the, and you know the, the fact that these are private entities. But again, something I think that COVID has shown us is the power of partnerships, public-private partnerships. So I mean Oxford University, you know, and AstraZeneca and a variety of other partnerships that. You know, in terms of antibiotic R&D, but also antibiotic, um, you know, further work, uh, you know, could become much more of a public partner, private partnership, a public private partnership. And indeed, uh, over the last few years, uh, as Manika, you know, knows that uh, we, we, there have been discussions about how you bring universities and other academic bodies far more into the into the mix here and working together with companies. So maybe that's one option, one thing that again of COVID-19 pandemic has, has highlighted for us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Public-private partnership. Uh, Manika, this is your specialist area, but yeah. uh, yes, the floor is yours. Yeah, I mean, I, I probably would make some some comments to say that, you know, the, the, the antibiotic space is very challenging, I think. Um, uh, you know, I think even if we, we look at, uh, well, first of all, I would say that I, I agree with the comment that we need to look at, at uh, a multi-sectoral approach and, and obviously public-private partnerships represent a, a, a component of that because I, I think this problem is just too big to be dealt with by one individual sector. Nobody's going to come up with a magic solution. And this, this means that in some ways it's harder, but in some ways you can actually, you know, leverage, I think, the strengths of different um, kinds of actors in this game. Um, in, in respect to the private sector, I think this is this is quite challenging because I think, you know, for instance, we work with the private sector. Um, some of these are very small companies, um, and you know we have to recognise that you know actually the, the viability for some of these companies is very limited. It's they have they have they have a very difficult job. Uh, they have struggle to raise financing for this. Um, you know, even the public financing that is put in through public-private partnerships are limited. Um, private financing will be limited because it's not seen as profitable enough. You know, why put money there when you can make much more money investing somewhere else, even in the biomedical field? 
Uh, and I think that raises a lot of, of problems and challenges, even in the private sector alone. Uh, and so I think the, the whole issue about how this, this kind of scenario can continue is quite questionable. I mean, for me, I, I, I think that we will see far bigger challenges in the years ahead, unless there are some, some major um, corrections there, I would say. And I, I would strongly support you know, incentives for the private sector um, to do this. But I would also add that you know, we have to see what is the end term objective. It's the point that Joanne is making that if we still don't receive, uh, achieve the end, end term objectives, then these, these are just means to an end that have been nice as a means, but have not achieved your end. And to me, access to these countermeasures that we develop, whether they're an antibiotic or diagnostic and so on, has to be the principal objective if we are serious about addressing uh, antimicrobial resistance as a kind of global um, pandemic. And I, just, I think this applies to, to any, uh, uh, any um, uh, you know, area in medicine and, and public health, but particularly when we talk about infectious diseases and, uh, and pandemics. Uh, well, we're getting a lot of questions uh, in on these patent rights, and Manika, you may have already touched on this, but I'll uh, just give you the question of somebody here, which is, uh, you know, when you talk of innovation, do you believe that governments should allow pharmaceutical and biomedical corporations to, ha to have patent rights? that the uh, questioner then says may help silo AMR research and drive the silent pandemic. Yeah, and I think you know this is this is obviously um, a discussion that has come up in other areas. But you know, my per and this is my personal opinion. I I just don't think this is necessarily the problem that we face in antimicrobial resistance. As I mentioned before, we have a concern about even availability and access to some old antibiotics that are off patent, uh, and we haven't found a solution to this problem. Uh, and this 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 is to me of great concern because. It's easy to say, oh, well, let's just use all the nice new drugs and the new toys, and then we forget about the old ones. Uh, so I do think that, that that in itself shows that we have a more fundamental problem here about, uh, about you know, I would say how, how we value these antibiotics at the end of the day within society and how we use them. Uh, and so I think this is more, to me, the issue that needs to be addressed. Again, it's, it's an opinion. It's my opinion. Um, but, you know, the problem is that we can go down a kind of silo uh, or uh, a rabbit hole if we, want, if we want to talk about intellectual property, which is, which is quite a compl complicated issue. And I think there are different areas where I think this has been a challenge in terms of access. And I think in the antimicrobial space, I think we have other, you know, far bigger problems that we have to solve here. Um, I think when it, when it, when it comes to, to new innovation, I can actually make the same point that I'm not sure that adding 10 years of extra patent life is going to change the change the issue either for the better. Um, you're still not in it. For if you're a small biotech company, your situation may change from a perception point of view. But if you're still not really seen as doing something that is as commercially interesting as making an oncology drug, that you're you're still going to have a problem. And I think it goes to a more fundamental aspect of how we just think about how we want to kind of incentivize innovation for these kind of drugs uh, or, or these kind of technologies and then how we want to make them essential um, accessible and i still think there's somehow a disconnect there mm. yes indeed and we've heard about all those small biotechs who actually go to the wall uh, you know trying uh, to make these uh, antibiotics um there's a there's a there's a question here which uh, is also uh, i think uh, definitely one for Joanne and Mark. Uh, the questioner says, excellent uh, presentations. Okay, um, here we are. Manika, when you in say incentives to support R&D are an important enabler, yet we need to ensure access. It brings to mind the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, which requires a minus 70 degree cold chain, bringing up concern about accessibility. Is this a lesson learned too from the lightning speed responses to COVID? How can we assure that research prioritize tools that can be accessible to all? Yes, in, in, indeed. And I just add a personal note, my mother's 93, lives in Kent in the UK, and that surgery does not have the refrigeration for the BioNTech or the Moderna. So it's not just uh, everywhere, it's in the UK too. So I think that's, um, I don't know, Manika, and perhaps everybody uh, would like to talk about this, because of course the, the, the early kids on the block with the Pfizer and Moderna, but they're not going to be accessible to 
to, to everybody. So, you know, how can we ensure that research prioritizes tools? Uh, Manika, and then I'll bring in uh, Joanne and Mark. I know, I think the reality of it is, is indeed like just one of the, the, the truths of it that we've seen with COVID-19 is that we were not going to have one single vaccine that was going to solve the entire problem. And it's the same with antibiotics. It's not one magic antibiotic we're going to develop in the next decade. Maybe in some Star Trek future we might do, but uh, in the near future, there's not going to be one drug that's going to come out that's going to be the solution to all the problems. It just doesn't work that way. Um, and indeed, we see the same phenomena, I think, with, with COVID vaccines. I think one of the things that was a good move, in a way, was to invent, uh, invest in multiple different types of technologies because, um, well, actually, we had no one, I, uh, we couldn't say for sure whether they'd all work. What happens if this is the only vaccine that can work? Well, maybe it will have, it, it will have limitations in terms of what can it do, but you cannot say that it's completely useless. Um, so I think it, there was a necessity to look at multiple different options uh, because of the uncertainty of, of involved around research and development. Now, what happens in the next stage? Well, that, the, the, the vaccine pipeline is in constant evolution. There are new vaccines that are also coming out. There's a single dose vaccine that is now recently uh, approved. And I think all of these, what I think uh, will be important for public health policymakers is to find a way to kind of sequence these vaccines the right way uh, but also ensure that there's some equitability in it uh, and not ensure that, you know, we have a, a kind of apartheid system being created in terms of um, vaccines, the nice ones for the super rich and the, 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 the OK ones for the, you know, the big part of the world. And, and you know, you, you see where I'm going with that. I think I, what I, we really need to say is these are how we should be using these vaccines and apply them across the board everywhere in the world. And I think that's, to me, where I think we need to show some um, you know, uh, some intelligence and some coordination, I think, in how these discussions happen. I'm not sure that that will be the case, but let's see. Um, um, but but no, that's interesting. And, and yes, indeed, the pharma industry would say that they're uh, building the plane and flying it, and we didn't know what vaccines we were going to get out first. But Joanne, I, I suppose the intent of this question is, you know, uh, should we uh, you know, prioritise research that, uh, you know, gives us uh, uh, tools that are accessible to, to, to all, because, of course, at the moment, yes, there are other vaccines coming down the line which will be more accessible to all, but the first ones out were not so accessible. But, Joanne, if you would like to give your thoughts to that questioner. Well, thank you. I want to support, you know, what, what um, endorse what, what Monica said, but I think it, it, it goes from the beginning of the conversation on the fact that um, if you don't have and if you don't put around the table the other countries with other and different realities, it would not be taken into consideration. Because if you have, you know, high income countries sitting around, it's like, and, and, and then they just say, oh, well, you know, a cold chain of minus 80 degrees. Oh, well, I guess we can manage, you know, we'll buy some fridge. The thing is, if you would have a low middle income country, you say, wait a minute, there is no way that we can handle that even in our wildest dream, because people kept saying, yeah, yeah, but DRC did it in 2018, you know, with Ebola. But the thing is, people don't remember that the world wanted what was there to help DRC to pull through. And, and it wasn't it was like a, a pandemic where everybody was, was you know, self uh, inward looking, trying to struggle through to through the pandemic. So it's a completely different ballgame. So I think that it's, this, is, this is for me, um, and uh, the, the very, very fundamental reason why you need to be inclusive and diversified when you are thinking about, um, I would say, um, uh, sh shaping and crafting those kind of platforms for, for R&D. And then people, uh, because otherwise this, this is the only way you're going to get at the end uh, a, a target profile of a product that is basically usable in different contexts. And then this is as well um, the best way to make sure that you won't have blind spots about what you're going to develop. Because by having a diversified, I would say, community around the table saying, you know, these are the things that we would like, then you will realize that most likely you're going to have only one product. And this is why it's good to have different options. But, but you need as well to make sure that it can be used in different contexts. And this might be a blind spot when you don't have everybody being able to voice what are the limits, what are the difficulties in their context. 
Um, Mark is nodding uh, very uh, clearly to me uh, over the panel uh, from the South African perspective. Uh, would you like to uh, pick up on what has been said about this, about research priorities and indeed making sure that everybody's around the table and it's not just a Western lens that people are looking through? Well, I mean, I, I, I think Monica and, and Joanne have, have, said, have said it all and very eloquently. I mean, I think my, my two pennies worth, um, to use your phrase. Um, I mean, the first, the first two things, I think the first is that, you know, I think one has to accept that um, with, uh, particularly with a very rapidly developing technology and, and challenge like COVID and vaccine production, that you're going to start off with um, products that may not be able to be, um, uh, you know, uh, accessible to all because of, for example, the minus 70. But I mean, I think now what we're seeing already is is now the sort of second generation saying, okay, this is the problem. We're now going to be able to uh, develop this to be uh, to 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 not need minus 70 to be able to be, you know, more accessible. So I think there's that. I think one has to appreciate and acknowledge that that's going to happen. To me, the access issue actually sitting for in South Africa in a low middle income country um, is more fundamental. Um, and that is that uh, I totally agree with Joanne that you have to have everybody around the table to give the perspective. But look what's happened yet again. High income countries have bought up um, huge numbers of, the do of doses of vaccine without any regard for, you know, even if low middle income countries probably had wanted to um, or been able to. So again, low middle income countries have been you know, last in the pecking order. And there are already still countries who haven't vaccinated anybody. Um, and that's criminal if you think about the health workforce of all these countries that are the you know, cornerstone and the integrity of, of their pandemic response um, to be in that position. So what I would say to you is, you know, actually what we need is for people to come together to understand how, you know, pandemic preparedness can write into itself in the future going forward that this sort of situation doesn't happen again. You know, again, I say it is it is no longer tenable and it is, you know, we're not living in an era now anymore where this should be happening into low middle income countries. And yep, low middle income countries need to stand forward and, and you know, and be more forceful about it. But I don't want to see the next pandemic with disease X in the same situation where we're waiting in line. That's not right. Yeah. Manika. Yeah, I'll, I'll just make a couple of comments just to say that, you know, um, first, just to make, make the point that one of the reasons why the, the innovation so-called side of, of um, uh, you know, COVID-19, where we have seen some success, at least on the vaccine side, uh, and, 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 you know, to some degree, I would also say on the diagnostics has been phenomenal in the sense because it has been a kind of multi-sectoral response. You hadn't, it's not just one sector that was doing all the work you saw a real coming together of different actors in the public and private sector you know you had a huge public investment being put in which i think really should be recognized as as a big positive um and you know i do think that the private sector also stepped up and and started to play a very constructive role i think that should also be be recognized and we should also recognize that you know that has innovation has come from many different sources as well including from you know academic groups and and you know um well, I would say outside the, 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 the traditional sectors are where uh, a lot of these things can emerge. But I would also say that where, where there has been the challenges is that the typical problem that I've seen happening in global health in my entire career, which is to totally disconnect innovation and access. And you see this happening all the time. And I've been talking about this for a long time. And it gets so frustrating because, you, you, in a way, the same thing played out in the early days of HIV. And you say, see the same thing happening in other areas where Hey, oh, what, we just need to focus on the innovation and we'll, we'll come to the access afterwards. Uh, and that is just, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way because in actual fact, they're not two separate worlds. There is a transition when you move from innovation into access. And that area of the transition is often the most complex part. And there has to be a recognition that there needs to be a much more integrated approach when we look at, at the uh, innovation and particularly in late stage R&D and how we're going to approach access, and that has to be also be uh, uh, inclusive as well. Uh, but I do, I did want to make that point because I don't still think it's entirely well understood by policymakers. And I've been in many policy discussions where 
people have said, no, no, we're talking about access, this is not an innovation discussion, or vice versa. And I find that actually quite problematic. Thank you, Manika. There's a question here, it's quite a specific question. So Manika, see whether you can have a go at it. It says, the Fleming Fund has work, is working very hard to get data on AMR into the hands of policymakers. Uh, this has meant working in partnership with others and governments. Are there any suggestions on how the Fleming Fund could be more effective raising the profile of AMR as the silent pandemic and getting the powers that be to take notice? I'm going to bat this to Mark because he's exactly the kind of person who's had to use data to convince government, <laughs> particularly the field of antimicrobial resistance. So I'm sorry, Mark, I'm bad that to you. <laughs> Sure, well, I'm going, to bat this, I'm going to bat this to Joanne because she's exactly, no, I'm, um, I'll, I'll have a go. Um, I, I mean, I, I, firstly, the Fleming Fund have done amazing uh, work and, you know, their contribution um, has been wonderful, um, particularly with respect to, you know, their core, the core um, work of trying to, uh, trying to develop laboratory infrastructure and, you know, the whole sort of surveillance diagnostics in countries, in low-income countries. So, you know, that's that's an important role they played. To me, the answer is, um, if I hear the question correctly, you know, what more can you do? The Fleming Fund, like all large bodies that have, you know, significant backing, you know, who's behind the Fleming Fund? Well, who's behind the Fleming Fund is the UK government. Um, and, you know, very powerful voices like Sally uh, Davis and others who have real voices. And it's going to take everybody working together to move this uh, project forward, this global project forward. So I think, you know, that, that there are specific levels that the Fleming Fund would work at and other other in, uh, organizations will work at. So you have your core work, which, you know, as, as described, but the Fleming Fund should be a powerful voice in at high level policy um, discussions, whether that be at the UN level or WHO and tripartite level. Um, and everybody has their part to play. Um, and as what I was trying to say in my talk again was, you know, highlighting the issue of everybody coming together to a single purpose. It's clear the Fleming Fund are absolutely committed to it, but you know we need to bring in everybody else. And we had a discussion that was an issue about civil society and the faceless pandemic. You know we're not getting civil society involved enough, and we're not building an AMR civil society. Sometimes it has to be built. It's not ready-made, and particularly in a problem that is so multi-dimensional. It's not. We're not talking about a single disease or a single bacteria or a single pathogen. We're talking about multiple, but we're not building anything yet. We're not getting people with AMR experiences together as a group, building as a society, like has been done for long COVID or for other things, you know, that that have readily have readily lent their hand to that. So it's a sort of a roundabout um, discussion on the question, but I think it, the question itself, although specific for the Fleming Fund, brought in other issues. Um, Mark, Mark batted that question to you, Joanne. Would you like to uh, take the uh, the opportunity to say something? No, I'm good. You're good. And we are almost good on this because I'm looking at the time and there's one great question that's come in, which I think just sort of makes a nice end question. Uh, so thank you um, to Rebecca Sugden, who's asked this question. So I'm going to ask all three of you and then I think we'll end on time. It looks like there will be a follow-up to the 2016 UN General Assembly discussion on AMR via a virtual high-level dialogue in the spring this year. If you were able to influence the agenda, what one thing would you want UN member states to discuss and reflect on? I think it's a great question perhaps to end this uh, discussion. Mark, I'll go to you, and then Joanne, and then Manika. I, I deflect, as Manika deflected the last one to me. I'm going to think about it and deflect it to him now, this one, because I need a minute to think about Becky's extremely good question. It is. Okay. Uh, Manika, and then Joanne, and then we'll see whether Mark has uh, 
come up with the, the answer that he wants to disclose in public. Manika. You know, I, I think there's, there's quite a lot of things that need to be done, like any complex problem. You know, you can't just solve it by one ask. So the only ask I would make is, guys, just take it seriously and take your responsibilities. Thank you, is what I would say. Joanne. Yeah, that's a tough question, but I, I think that my plea for um, for member states would be that um, to change their mindset in discussing MR uh, of uh, away from um, uh, away from from the asymmetric um, to, to actually push back on the fact that if there is an asymmetric financing on an issue, there shouldn't be an asymmetric power that is sustained. And because by doing that, we're replicating, uh, we're replicating the, the fall, uh, I would say, model. It, like what I'm trying to say is, is when you give a lot of money, you have big say. When you give little money, you have little say. And so as long as we're going to keep that kind of dynamic of asymmetric influence, asymmetric power tailored to you, to your asymmetric financing input, then we are set, I say, I think, to, to fall short most of the time. Mark, the last minute is yours. <laughs> okay, I I'd want to say quite a lot to the to, to the meeting, but I think um, my bottom line is um, I, I'd like I'd like people to get serious about the about the underlying issues of how to mitigate this pandemic. Um, it, this is not just about financing R&D um, and the, the side of new antibiotics. The, the, the global powers need to take seriously the fact that this is a one world issue, as Joanne has so beautifully put it, um, that the world is still being, most of the world is still being asked to use antibiotics um, in place of uh, 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 me methods of control of infection that have been enjoyed by high income countries for decades now that low middle income countries still don't enjoy clean water safe you know sanitation etc vaccination programs prevention 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 stewardship it's not all about financing r and d and while we do that and only do that we are losing lives and that has to be acknowledged so broaden your focus to Becky. <laughs> Thank you uh, to our speakers and what would I would say to the organizers of the UN General Assembly virtual meeting is that you should invite uh, Mark Mendelssohn, Joanne Liu and Manika Balasigaram uh, to that meeting because really you have given some amazing insights, uh, the parallels with COVID and the fact that we've got to seize the moment uh, to tackle AMR uh, before people's attention deficit disorder uh, kicks in. So thank you everybody for joining us in great numbers uh, today for this very, very timely discussion. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.